Hi, I'm Pete and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. Well, I'm going to start a big project on my Farm All 504 today, but first I want to show you something else. Here we are. Got the heat turned on and everything in here. And my walnuts have been drying for what? Two or three weeks now? They're ready to crack. In fact, I've been eating them the last couple days. Whenever I feel a little peckish, I just come out here and turn on my walnut cracking machine and run a through few it. Run a few through it. <laughs> run a through few it. They're definitely dry. So I run them through the machine and a lot of them will come out as quarters like this. In fact, I got two of them here. Some of them will stay trapped in the shell like this. And I use a greasy old pair of side cutters to just nip the shell. And then it breaks. And then I pull the other quarter out. And eat it. I think I can eat them a lot faster than I crack them. But, as I said, it's a labor of love. Now then, on to the 504. And the easiest way to explain what I've got wrong here is to just show you. Well, that's not the problem. It needs a little choke. Hear that whine? That's issue number one. It's water in the hydraulic oil. In fact, it's so bad that I have to warm it up before the hydraulics will work. And one way to free it up and get it going is to actually use the power steering to warm up the oil and get it flowing a little bit. And then the hydraulics will work. That's not good. I ran it around, worked the hydraulics, and warmed it up, and they get better as the tractor warms up, which is indicative when it gets cold out like this of ice clogging the hydraulic filter. I got water coming into the transmission because, and I shouldn't do this, I've left it outside because I don't have room to store it inside with all the hay in the barn. The next problem is that she runs rough. Hear that? And that's to do with the ignition system, so we'll take care of that. The hydraulic levers don't stay in their detent positions for raise or lower, which means that when I push the lever up, it should stay there until the cylinder reaches the end of its travel. This one works sometimes, it's working right now, and other times it doesn't. And overall, they're harder to work than they should be. They take more strength to pull it to the operating position. And finally, let me shut this off. This tractor has governor and carburetor problems. It wanders when you're in the field driving RPM wise. So when you're going up a hill, the RPM slow down. When you're going downhill, the RPM speed up. That's indicative of play in the governor someplace. Not Probably not the governor spring, but wearing in the linkage here. And the carburetor has never, I've never rebuilt it. So I might as well do the carburetor and the governor at the same time. The question is, will it fit in my shop? Because I got all this crap all over the place here. I think it will width-wise, no problem. Length-wise, I got that hoist. I don't know, we'll try it. Just barely. I apologize for the background noise. It's my heater in my shop. Keeping me warm so I can work in shirt sleeves. The first thing I gotta do is drain the oil out of the transmission. Because the hydraulic system and the transmission share their oil. And looking at the underside of the tractor, there's the engine oil pan. There's three places to drain transmission oil on these. That's here, that's this TA case. And then here, at the back of the transmission and then way back there in the bull gear housing there's a plug right over the drawbar here we got to drain them all and we'll start with the TA case here or is this the hydraulic case I don't remember yeah she's milky oil I've seen worse though I drain these one at a time starting from the front if you start at the bull gear housing you're going to get on this tractor about 15 gallons out and usually if you drain the front compartments first you'll get less than five on each and then you'll get about five out the rear so you don't have to switch buckets midstream while it's draining. Now I'll just go ahead and open up the second plug. Who put that on there? That sure is tight. It wasn't me. 
Yes, it was. There's number two. Now to drain the bolt gear housing, I gotta move the drawbar over. And there's just two bolts that hold the draw, so swinging drawbar, they hold it in place. So I just take one of the bolts off and then I can swing the drawbar to one side. Just put that there for safekeeping. Now to drain the bull gear housing here, and everything's interconnected, but they have separate, they have baffles inside, so you gotta drain them all or you won't get it all out. This is a half inch socket wrench fitting. There we go. See the water coming out? see it dripping on my hands. Water always collects in the bottom of the cases if you've got water issues. There wasn't much in there but a little bit dripped out on my hand. The reason I did this first is because I want the oil to drip drain for as long as possible. I'll probably have this tractor in the shop for at least a couple days depending on what parts I need to order for the other work. So I'll just leave it open and let it drip out. It'll keep dripping for a long time. Is it drains off the sides of the cases. Well, I'm on the hydraulic system draining the fluid. I might as well attack the other thing that's the problem, and that's the spool valves. You can see the back side of the two of them right here, these tubes coming out the back. And this is how you disassemble these spool valves. These pipes at the back actually unscrew, and then you pull the valve body out or the spool out. And that's always the hardest part of the job, so I might as well do that first. Sometimes these things have been in so long that they rust around the threads and you wind up breaking the pipe. I've done that before and then had to go scavenging for a new one. We'll see how they go. Oh, that can one came loose all right. Let's try the other one. That one was easy. I'm in luck today. The hydraulic gods are shining on me. So then we just unscrew these and you gotta make sure you don't lose any of the little balls that sometimes fall out. Those are the detent balls. There we go. This is the back of the spool right here. We'll take the other one off. This is the one that the tent's actually working on. I'm going to have to get the front of that first. This is the front end of the spools that the levers are connected to. See, these are the ends of the spools here. And in order to pull the spools, I need to disconnect the levers. And then they pull out the back. I have never had these spools apart. I've had them apart on the other tractors, the 656, I had to rebuild them. But these ones were okay, not great. Now they're terrible. Pull that pin out. So now we've got the spools free to slide out the back. But I gotta move this one past the detent, and there we go, we're past the detent. Now I can just pull these out the back side and be careful of these balls here, you don't want to lose them. These were made as matched sets, the body and the spool. So you got to make sure to keep track of which one came out of which body. And this is the outside one and I'll probably stick a piece of tape around it and label it so I make sure I don't lose track. I took both spools out and next I'm going to take each spool apart because there are some replaceable pieces in here. There's a stem with an O-ring in here and there's an O-ring up front that's still in the valve body and then there's an O-ring back here and a small O-ring inside as well I believe. I'm going to take it all apart and then I want to explain how all this works because it's pretty fascinating, at least in my mind. We'll just clamp it in the vise here. You want to make sure when you're working with these <clears throat> that you don't scratch anything on the spool because the hydraulic tightness of the spool keeping it leak free is mainly dependent 
on tight clearances between the spool and its bore. That's why spools aren't interchangeable into different valve bodies because they're machined to fit each other on a one-off basis. So the first step to disassembling this is to take this plug out of the back. It's a screw plug. Little plug and underneath it there is a spring. Let me get a pick. A spring. So now that we got that off, we have to turn this piece off to release this spring here. This part of the assembly is not riding in a bore, so it's it's okay if it gets marked up a little bit. I hate to mark them up, so I put a shirt on them. There we go. Now there's another spring in here, so you got to hold everything together. There we go. So this is the, the detent assembly. I don't know what it's technically called, but that's what I'm calling it. And then there's a washer under here. And then when you get into this part of the valve, there's nothing else in here that's replaceable. There's a collar that I'll just slide off here. And then this O-ring, which I'll replace. And that's it. This is just one chunk of steel here. It's got some orifice holes in it and we'll clean it up real good before we put it back together. Set that aside. Now there's one other piece we got to get out of here, this detent assembly, and that's the piston that's inside of it, which is probably jammed up with crud and age. This comes out the top here. There it is. See how gooey and gummy that is? They don't work after a while. <laughs> I don't know, 50 years, 60 years? They don't make things like they used to, I guess. This is a little piston with an O-ring on it. And the last piece to take apart is, remember we had this, it's really just a piece of pipe with a plug on the end of it. And I loosened it up already with the pipe wrench. On later models, these plugs don't come off the end, but on this one it does. They change the design a little bit when they went to the 656 series. So in here we've got a little inset inside that this seats onto, like this, this sleeve here, which engages down here with this part and pushes on this spring, depending on where the valve is at in its travel. And then in the cap, there's a cap within the cap, so you can barely see it in there. You can see it better on the inside here. And this cap is meant to be removable to adjust the pressure on the valve detent. So now's the time when I need to sit down and explain to y'all exactly how this detent system and valve system works so that everything's a little clearer from here on out. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna build it back up from the basic. This is the valve spool. This is what moves within the valve body. So if you think of the valve body as kind of like a solid block of steel with a few holes in it, as this moves, moves well, on the tractor it's this way, moves back and forth in the valve body, it reveals holes in the valve body and the holes are closed up on this high section when the valve uh, spool is in that position but when it comes to an open section oil can flow through and so that's how the valve does work by oil flowing through and going to the hydraulic cylinder in this type of system this is an open center what's called an open center hydraulic system oil is flowing through this valve all the time, even when the cylinder uh, or the, the valve body is not doing any work, sending pressurized oil out to a cylinder. Oil is still flowing through it and back into the transmission, so there's oil continuously flowing through it. It's when you move the valve that the oil is sent to do work on a hydraulic circuit. So that's the basic spool and how it works. Now, all of the complication in the spool is at the end Toward, facing toward the rear end of the tractor. <laughs> I got this backwards. And it's the detent assembly, which is all the real complication. Let me get this put together correctly here. Washer first, and then this spring goes on here, and this big spring is called the centering spring. And when you pull on the lever, this is the spring that brings the, the lever back to neutral after you quit pulling on it. I just gotta screw this back on here, it's under tension from the spring. So this engages with this thing so when you're pulling the lever back and forth 
the spool always wants to return to the neutral position. Now the detents. Now inside of this, this is hollow, there is a ball, a steel ball at the bottom and a spring that keeps pressure on the steel ball. And that steel ball that's in the middle of the cylinder engages with two steel balls. I put one in the hole there. And so when that ball is pushing down in the middle of the cylinder, it pushes these balls here, and there would be one here, outward. And so when it hits a detent position, those balls fall into a groove that's around the outside in the valve body and they lock the cylinder there. So that's when you pull the lever back and then you can take your hand off of it when it's in the detent position and it will stay back. And the same thing when you push the lever forward. It's because these balls have come out from the cylinder and they've engaged with a groove in the valve body. Now what happens it, when the cylinder reaches the end of its travel, it's either fully retracted or fully extended, is you have a pressure buildup in here because the oil can't go anywhere. The cylinder's full or empty, whatever the case may be or however you want to think about it. When that pressure increases, this little piston that I took out in here, this teeny tiny thing which goes way down inside of here, gets engaged. And what this piston does is there's a tiny little orifice system in this that sends hydraulic oil up through the middle of this and puts pressure on this piston. So when the oil pressure builds up, this piston pushes up and pushes on the bottom of these steel balls. Remember the steel balls were what stuck out and engaged the grooves in the valve body. It pushes on the bottom of those steel balls or it pushes on the bottom of the ball in the center that's connected to or underneath the spring on top. It pushes that ball up so that these balls in the side can go back in. So as the pressure rises in the cylinder, pressure increases on the piston, pushes up on the ball in the center, lets these balls on the side retract, and then your whole valve spool returns to the neutral position via the spring. It sounds confusing, but it's really not. It's, you know, we're talking about, I don't know, 10 pieces here to the whole thing. Now what's happened, why my valves aren't working correctly, is it's just gummed up. This back end, you can see how much, how dirty this is. And what happens is crud and uh, rust and condensation always collect back here. And they wind up gumming up the works, especially this ball bear, this ball steel ball system, the detent system back here, gets all gummed up with with old oil and it doesn't work right. So half the battle here is just giving this a good cleaning. The other half of the battle is there's a couple replacement parts that are important. This little piston has a teeny tiny O-ring on it. The last time I bought one, I had to buy the whole assembly and this little teeny tiny thing was, I can't remember, I think it was like 40 bucks. And I said, what? I have had success just replacing the, the O-ring on these, even though they're teeny tiny and people say, oh, you're gonna damage the O-ring. I've done it and that's probably what I'll do here. And then you gotta make sure that the balls are clean because they gotta be round and clean in order to work properly. So clean up again. And then there are a couple O-rings. There's one O-ring that goes inside the valve body that came out with the spool. No big deal, Case IH has those. And then there's another O-ring in the valve body in the front, actually where this piece goes through. There's an O-ring seated in the valve body. You gotta pick that out, put a new one in. And then on this particular spool, which is different from the later ones, there is also an O-ring down in here, right here. So we're talking about a total of four O-rings and possibly a piston. And that's all there is to replace, really. The other thing to be aware of on these valves, and I'll use this other one that I have that's still fully assembled, is that first piece that I unscrewed, that controls the spring pressure on the poppet valve here, the, the, um, the detents, the ball detents. So the more you screw this in, the stronger the detent is. So this has to be adjusted after you put the valve back together. And the way that you adjust them is on this one that I took apart, this little plug here in the end, although it's been painted over, actually comes out. So when the valve's all assembled and you have the tractor running and you're checking the detents, 
you pop this little plug out and then you stick a screwdriver in and you're actually working on this that's down inside here to adjust the pressure till you get the, the kind of feel on the detent that you want. Here's a better view of it, but you see how this crud that accumulates in here? And that's really, that's the problem that happens to these detents. Let's see if we can pop that plug out because we're going to need to get it out anyway. Try tapping it out from the inside. Yep. There we go. Huh. That's that little plug. It's a piece of solid metal. Just friction fits in there. But boy, it would be a bear to remove if you didn't have access from the inside, which is surprising to me. Because you need to remove it from the outside to adjust it. So that puts me at a stopping point with the hydraulic valves. I got to order the O-rings and the pistons from my local Case IH dealer. And I just wanted to mention um, that whenever I work on assemblies like this, <laughs> it's nice to have a parts diagram and uh, the Case New Holland website still has parts diagrams for these old tractors. This is a hydraulic valve assembly and then it's got a list of part numbers. I just printed this off the computer so that I know what to order at the dealer instead of going in and saying, oh, I need that little O-ring that goes inside the hydraulic. They don't know what you're talking about. So I come with part numbers. It makes the parts man's job so much easier. The next thing I want to get into, and I'm probably going to have to order parts for this as well, is the governor, which is on the other side. I'll show you in a second. The carburetor. Here's the carburetor. When I bought this tractor, the tractor jockey that I bought it from said that they had rebuilt the carburetor. <laughs> I, I doubt they did a very good job just being the nature of the business. Um, so I'm going to pull this apart. And now on a tractor, what controls the engine speed is a combination of the carburetor and the governor. The two work as a pair. The, you want to maintain even RPMs, unlike a car where you step on the gas and you speed and slow the engine down. When you set the throttle on a tractor, you want to maintain steady RPMs, whatever the throttle setting is. And the way that the governor does that is it has an arm that goes to the carburetor here, which controls the air butterfly on the carburetor, which is how much air is going into the engine and how much fuel is getting pulled in with that air coming into the engine. When the butterfly is open, you're at maximum kind of gas fuel or fuel air mixture going in. And when the butterfly is closed or nearly closed, then you're down at idle speed. So as the load increases on the engine, the butterfly opens via this little arm. And on this particular engine, the arm's connected here to the carburetor and it runs around the front of the engine. And then the arm runs through here. You can barely see it under the front of the engine and the, gov and the governor is in this housing right here. When I drive this tractor, it doesn't maintain steady RPM. So whether I'm going downhill or uphill, it, the, the, the butterfly on the carburetor should be being controlled by the governor to maintain a steady RPM, whether the engine is under load or not. Until the engine gets overloaded, then it drags down RPM. I'm getting wander on the RPMs and as a temporary fix, I put this spring on here to take play out of the governor. But you can tell, see how much that rod moves? I can feel when it starts to engage the governor weights. I've got a lot of play in here. So something's worn and I gotta take things apart, probably more than one thing's worn, to figure out where the play in the wear is. We'll just clean this off before we take it off. So some, I'm out of brake cleaner, so this is carburetor cleaner. Get all the grime off here. If I'm lucky, I won't need to take this distributor housing off. I can just pull it off from the front, but we'll see. First, I gotta take this vent tube off to get at this mounting bolt for the governor, which is just two little bolts up here. Pull that off. I already disconnected the, the, the linkages on this side. Look at how loose that is. He's definitely got issues. Without engaging the weights at all, I got that much play and I got side to side play. And I already disconnected it on the other side as well. So all I gotta do is take these bolts out and then pull it right out. Before I pull that governor off, I gotta go and check on my other project for the day outside. I came out in the dark this morning at six o'clock and put this pork belly on and these are big fat chunks that I've had now it's one or two in the afternoon. So they've been smoking here for a long time. I'm just about out of coal. 
it's only about 40 degrees out today so I go through coal faster but I'm gonna improvise I don't have any more to put on so I'm gonna put them in this dish cover them and put them in the oven at about 250 degrees and let them finish there they'll have a nice smoke flavor they've been in here long enough and then I'll be able to fill my tummy after working on the tractor all day all right having taken care of the most important thing of the day dinner we can pull this off and I can drop the light a few hundred more times All right, I got all the bolts out. We'll see if she'll come loose. This gasket's probably stuck it on there pretty good. There she comes. Come loose. No, I only got to drop the light 99 more times. Feels like I left a bolt in there. Let me check. I love working on things that I can't see. Yeah, sure enough, I missed one. Right there. Now she's coming loose. All right. This is the arm that goes across the front of the engine and engages with the carburetor butterfly shaft here. Let's take a look. Now that I got this governor partially apart, I can explain how it works. And it's gonna be a little bit complicated because uh, part of the governor I'm leaving on the tractor here. I'm going to take these weights off to check the pins that they're mounted to. But the basic idea of a governor is centrifugal force. So the faster the shaft is turning and it's connected to the engine with a timing gear that's back in here, the more, the more force these weights want to come out with. And as they come out, it pushes this little sleeve here ahead. And there's a thrust bearing on here and that's where it mates with the other half of the governor I have on the bench. Oh, and before I leave this part, there's a little bumper here which keeps everything tight. There's a spring on the other side of this and it keeps everything tight going back to engage the distributor because this same gear that drives the governor drives the distributor back here. But I'm leaving this together for now because I don't need to get in there. So remember at that assembly on the tractor, those weights pushing out pushed that sleeve ahead and then pushed that thrust bearing ahead as the engine went faster. And that thrust bearing engages with these two little forks here. And what it happens is the more force that it exerts, the more it pushes this this way and the throttle lever coming from the throttle shaft on the dashboard is right here. It's this lever right here. So what you've got is a spring back in there and as this pushes, as the weights are exerting more force, it tries to stretch the spring. So the spring is what holds everything in equilibrium and holds the engine RPM steady. And then coming out from this same shaft that the butterfly or the, the little tabs are attached to, is this and this is the linkage that goes back to the carburetor and tells the carburetor give the engine more gas and air or not give the engine more gas and air and the whole thing works in a balance to keep the engine rpm steady no matter what the load is at least until the engine reaches its maximum load and starts to bog down rpms there's a couple other parts i didn't cover here there's a bumper spring back in here that kind of helps to keep it from surging to keep, to keep it from kind of hunting for the right RPM when you're, when you're under load, that thing buffers it so that it reaches equilibrium faster. And when these springs go bad, that's where you have, that's when you have a hunting governor where it's kind of, you know, it doesn't maintain a steady RPM like it should. Next, we'll see what's bad in this. And there's a whole bunch of things that are bad. What is wrong with this governor is an accumulation of things that all create that sort of looseness in the throttle that I'm experiencing. The first thing is where the throttle comes in. This is the throttle shaft coming in from the lever on the dash. I've got lots of play in here. 
This back and forth play is factory, that's no big deal. But I've got this side to side that really shouldn't be there. So I've got to take care of that. And then in this shaft that goes to the carburetor, I've got play in here as well. And it's hard to show, but maybe you can see it. And so in this case, I've got a needle bearing here and a needle bearing there, and it looks like they've just worn. And then I believe there's a bushing in here and an oil seal, and I'll have to replace those as well as the needle bearings. While I'm in here, I'll replace the main spring here and the bumper spring down there. And I need to take this off and figure out if I need to bore out the hole and put a, a, a bushing in there to tighten things up. I think that that's probably what's going to need to be done. There's a couple other adjustments on here. Obviously, you can adjust the bumper spring. You take this acorn nut off and then you can adjust the tension or the compression on this spring to minimize hunting. And then up here you've got a limit uh, bolt that brings the throttle to a limit. It hits up in here and hits that throttle lever. So that's your throttle limit. And then a vent tube that comes out of here that's one of the crankcase vents. I'm gonna take these weights off here so that I can check where on the shafts that they ride on. And the other thing that often goes bad in these governors is the thrust bearing. But this one is fine. It is nice and smooth and it's fine. It's a three-piece thrust bearing, so you've got a race and then you've got the balls in a, in a, uh, oh, there go the balls. Well, I'll have to rescue them. <laughs> and then you've got another race here that comes off. And then you've got this plastic sleeve that rides on the shaft. And the shaft, there's a bushing back in here, but the shaft is nice and tight. So there's no need for me to take the timing gear out and go through all that trouble. So next I'm gonna pull these, gate, these weights off and just check where on the shafts. Actually, I can't pull the pins with this gear still in. So I think I'm gonna have to pull this out and I believe it comes out this way. Should. Yeah, it's coming. It's just sticky is all. Now I'm going to have to retime everything, of course, when I put it back together if I pull this gear out. Which is not a big deal. There we go. These are the tangs that engage the distributor or the magneto if you have a magneto. Actually, I'm glad I pulled this out because that bushing's got a long crack in it and I can feel it with my fingernail. That bushing needs to be replaced, which means I'm probably going to have to take the distributor off too. That's a bummer. Well, now that I got this out, we'll pull the weights off, and I'm concerned about wear on the pins and the weights where the pins go through the weights. Just a couple cotter pins in here to take out. You should push right out. Blink. So there's one weight. And it's pin. I'll keep them together, weight and pin. Now that I have this timing gear that drives the governor and the distributor, you can see the timing marks, which are two dots right there. That's where it meshes with, um, I believe it's camshaft gear that it's coming into. So I'm looking at these pins, and you can see that wear right there, and. It's pretty good. It's probably, <laughs> my rough guess, at least a couple thousandths off my fingernail on both sides where the governor weights wore into it. And that's creating slop in the governor weight. A certain amount of slop is okay, but I think that's kind of excessive, the amount of wear that's in there. So I'll get new pins for it as well. The weights I can't do much about but I assume that when I get new pins it should take a lot of the play out. And I'll get a new thrust bearing as well. The balls fell out of this one which is not uncommon but while I'm in here it's cheap. It's cheap insurance. Yeah definitely. One way to check whether it's the governor weight hole that's worn or the pin that's worn is to just slide the pin in and seat it at an unworn area on the pin and see how much play you get. 
So we'll just slide it in. There's unworn. Yeah, that's that's much better. So it needs new pens. I guess before I can order parts for this, I need to take these two shafts out and see what kind of wear I have on the shaft. So it can either wear at the bushing or wear at the shaft. And this is the shaft that comes off of the throttle linkage. And I don't see any obvious wear on it. I suspect that the wear is in the hole here and that I'm going to have to drill this out and put a bushing in to fit to tighten it up. Because it doesn't have a bushing in it now, just an oil seal. Next we'll take out this shaft here and see how it looks. Breaking these screws loose is fun. Because of course they're put in as tight as possible. There we go. This butterfly has to be disconnected before the shaft will pull out. Or whatever you want to call it. Forks, butterflies. Actually the technical name is fork. It is a fork. And there's the fork. This is where it rides on that thrust bearing and it's got a little wear on it but it is really no big deal. Pull the shaft out. We've got a bushing and an oil seal that rides on the shaft here. There's a slight amount of wear, but really not, not, not much. And then we've got a needle bearing here, and we've got a needle bearing here. Hmm. That's got some wear on it. Interesting. I think what I'll do with this, I can make a new one of these if I have to. This is just stock dowel here and I can cut this flat spot in it. Reweld it on here, but I want to see how the new bearings fit on here and see if I have a tight fit before I go to all that trouble. And you can see there's the needle bearings in there. I don't know if you can see that, probably just barely. Those are going to have to be replaced. Well, it's starting your quitting time and time to go in for dinner and I'm not sharing that pork belly with you. I'm going to eat it all myself. <laughs> it's sitting in the oven. Uh, I've got everything I need to get apart. I know what I need for the governor and I know what I need for the hydraulic valves. And the carburetor I know what I need too even though I don't have it off. I just need to get a complete rebuild kit and then I'll have to take the carburetor off and soak it and take it apart and assess it but I'm sure it just needs a kit. Uh, a couple notes about this tractor provenance. I bought this tractor five, six, seven years ago, something like that, off of a tractor jockey who's, tractor jockeys are guys that buy old tractors and then they'll kind of do what they have to do to get them running if they're not running and then they flip them, they turn them around and sell them at a profit. So I bought this tractor off that guy and it was, it was in really sad shape. The steering system was shot, the wheels pointed like this, the motor, the engine was shot. Um, so when I got it, I did a lot of work on it. I tore it all apart and obviously I cleaned it up and painted it. I rebuilt the engine. I did an in-frame rebuild on the engine. These engines are really expensive to rebuild because they're kind of an oddball engine. This tractor has an interesting sort of manufacturing history and I'm a nerd about these kinds of things. I get into them. A lot of people will say, oh, this engine is the same or close to the engine in the old H's, but it's a completely different engine. The engine in the H was a C152, which in international harvester speak is C carbureted, which means it's a gas engine. 152 is the displacement, 152 cubic inches. That's the engine in H. This engine is a C153. And so people thought, well, it was the evolution of the H engine. It's not it's actually the evolution of the engine that was in the A, the B, the C, in the Super C, it started out the same engine block pretty much as a C113 engine, 113 cubic inches displacement. Over the years, Harvester gradually increased the displacement and the compression ratio and other little things about the engine to get more power out of it. This engine's rated at around 45 horsepower 
I believe, off the PTO. I'm just working from memory here. It is a sleeveless engine. It's kind of this block brought to its end, kind of its end maximum displacement. It's just pistons in the parent bore. So if you have to overhaul it, you bore out the parent bore 10, 20, 30 thousandths. You put in oversized pistons and that's how you rebuild it. It being, in, in essence, an, the same engine as is in a Farmall A, they wound it tight. They increase compression, they increase displacement as much as they can. It doesn't have the lugging power of an H engine. I have no idea why Harvester put this. It would have been a lot better to, to put a, an H series engine in it. It would have been a much better tractor. These tractors often get a bad rap because they just fall on their face when you try to do serious pulling with them. It works okay for a loader tractor and a light hay duty and raking tractor for me. The back end of the tractor I've never really been into. It, it's always been fine. The torque amplifier on it's fine. I had to do some adjustment as you always do with torque amplifiers to get it to mesh correctly. With the main transmission, never had a problem with it except for water in the fluid which has been a perennial issue even when I stored this tractor inside. I've changed it and changed the transmission hydraulic oil and still had problems with moisture. Um, other than that, the rear end in it is fine. So that's kind of the history of the 504 and my history with this tractor. In the next episode, after a, a little while for me to get parts in, we'll put everything back together and get her running again. Hopefully she'll run a heck of a lot nicer than she did. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.